So I've been trying to master the art of listening ever since attending my first TED conference. I was mesmerized. I found myself hanging on the word of every speaker. Some of them made me laugh. A few of them made me cry. A handful of them really scared me. <laughs> but I found myself seeing the world through a whole new lens. At the risk of sounding slightly dramatic, I felt literally transformed by the experience. I could not wait to go home and tell my friends and family about the things that I had heard. But sadly, that feeling of transformation disappeared almost immediately after leaving TED. And while I paid close attention, the information I had heard became more elusive the harder I tried to recall it. No, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised because I'd heard from almost 100 speakers in five days' time, many of whom were talking about things that I'd never heard of. But I think the issue is more fundamental than that. I think it's the difference between hearing and listening. Because you only hear with your ears, but you listen with your mind. And so this is the eve of my eighth TED conference, and ever since that first year, I go to every TED with the intent purpose of trying to savor every moment live in the presence, absorb as much material as possible, and find ways not to just sustain the content, but the spirit of the conference as a whole. So I've developed five lessons. And here's what I've learned so far. The first is to give it your all. Now, it seems obvious, but the first piece of advice I got from Ted was, don't miss a moment. And yet, in 2008, I made the decision, against my better judgment, to schedule a business call in the middle of the program. I took some comfort having looked at the schedule and said, this isn't a speaker I've ever heard of. And she's talking about neuroscience and I work in automotive. <laughs> Not the end of the world if I miss it. Well, the speaker I missed was Jill Bolte Taylor. She spoke about the stroke of insight. And if those of you aren't familiar with her, she came on stage with a human head, a human brain in her hands. The spinal cord was still attached. She told the most remarkable and personal story of what it was like to experience a stroke at the age of 37. And the way she describes this medical emergency is almost like a spiritual awakening. Of course, I can go back and watch it online, and I've done that. But it's not the same as being in the audience and being part of a collective that got to experience her words firsthand. So my second advice to you is to take note. Now, when you go to a TED conference, you might find yourself in an auditorium with heads of state, captains of industry, Nobel Prize winners. It's easy to get very distracted. But if you take notes, you'll find yourself staying in the moment. You'll be more engaged, and you'll have a better record of what took place. Now, since we were young, we've been taught to listen with an analytical ear and just record the headlines. But for me, that doesn't work. I strive to capture every single word as it's being said. Now, of course, I fall short of verbatim, and my notes are filled with typos and lots of gaps. But what it does is it forces me to entertain every thought that's being said. Because what I find is that most people only tend to write down the ideas that reinforce what they already believe. So if you strive to record everything, then you're not letting yourself the opportunity to censor the content. So I'm not an artist. My background is in finance and uh, law, and I work for an automotive company. But my favorite part of TED is coming up with these drawings. And it's a luxury that I only indulge in when I go to the TED conferences. But I go back and I look at the notes and I add illustrations about what was the essence of what they were trying to say, or what were the big themes that came across. And sometimes, when I'm being a particularly good mom, I sit and color them with my kids when I get home. <laughs> but these notes, they sit at my desk, and they serve as a reference, a daily source of insights, and a reminder of inspiration. At the TED conference in February, I took 121 pages of notes, and I have four or five volumes of the last TEDs that I've attended. Third piece of advice, be open to new possibilities. Now, Every speaker deserves a chance to be heard. We have to challenge ourselves to let go of our biases, our prejudices, 
the way in which we see the world. Of course, it's easier said than done, but I ask you to quiet that voice in your head that contradicts what the speakers have to say, because they might open your horizons. So I think about Sherry Turkle, the MIT professor, who is a pioneer heralding the benefits of the internet, who a year or two ago took to that stage to talk about all of the concerns, the worries she had about technology. She said, I don't like the impact it's having on society or its tendency to make us escape loneliness. But more critically, could our reliance on digital devices mean that we're eliminating those moments of silence where insight and introspection are born, the birthplace of innovation? If you want to be really open-minded, then there are a number of talks that talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And who am I to say that they're wrong? I think about the words of Carl Sagan, who says that when you consider our place in the universe, perhaps it's a little arrogant for us to think that we're the center of it. And even uh, last talk, we heard from the founder of the internet, who said maybe the internet's next generation is interplanetary. So my third lesson for you is to challenge yourself. We're quick to label ourselves, right brain, left brain, but can't we be a balance of both? So a couple years ago, an economist by the name of Daniel Kahneman talked about the experiencing self and the remembering self. And he said that the reason that we have such a hard time understanding happiness is because we have two identities. And the experiencing self is always hijacked by the remembering self. And I guess that speaks to this idea about listening. What you listen to or what you remember listening may not be what you actually heard. But what if you lean a little bit more towards the science? Ted Prize winner JR could teach you about the importance of changing art. He said, art isn't intended to change the world, but it's powerful because it can change the way that you see the world. So my fifth lesson to you is to savor every moment. I find that I'm the very best version of myself when I'm at TED. I'm more engaged, I have heightened awareness, and I'm reminded that my viewpoint is infinitely small. So the way that I savor it is I try to capture nonverbal moments. So Natalie Merchant sang a couple of years ago at TED, and she's my all-time favorite artist. I've seen her perform in concert many times, but my favorite performance is the one she gave at TED. It felt so intimate. Earlier this year, we also saw from a Chinese artist who calls himself the invisible artist, and he literally hides himself inside his paintings. The one on the, let's see, your right, um, would be a collaboration that he did with JR. So you can see the influence and how these things come together. My favorite all-time TED Talk in seven years of attending TED came from a three-minute attendee speech by a 24-year-old girl named Glenna Fermeni. She told a tale of what it was like to hear two years earlier by a doctor on Christmas Eve that she had three years left to live. She had terminal cancer. And she said, ever since that moment, people have been trying to create bucket lists for her. But she had her own vision of what should be done. She said the day, how she was spending her time. She laughed, she cried, she played. But she continued her study in nursing. Now, people said, well, she must be in denial. Doesn't she know the odds are that she may never become a nurse? And she said, what if my doctor's wrong? What would he have me do? Become a barista at Starbucks? She said, I can barely order the coffee, let alone think about making it for others. And then she reminded everyone in the audience. She said, I may be dying, but so are you. So what kind of plans are you putting forward? So as I revisit these five tips about the art of listening, keeping the spirit of TED alive, giving it your all, taking note of everything that happens around you, being open to the possibilities, challenging yourself, and savoring every moment, I wonder if these lessons apply equally to the art of living. Because living is the sa isn't the same as embracing life, just like hearing isn't the same as listening. Thank you.